Something that comes up a lot in my Tales from the Tube is tiling. Specifically, the individual tiling patterns that you get on the old Bakerloo, Piccadilly and Northern Line platforms. Colourful tiling patterns like these are one of the Underground's many visually distinctive elements. They date back to the era when the Piccadilly and Bakerloo lines and the Charing Cross branch of the Northern Line were being built. These three lines were owned by Underground Electric Railways of London and were built with a common aesthetic, what we would now call a corporate identity. Every station at platform level would incorporate a tiling pattern unique to that station. In the video on Hyde Park Corner I said that these were either just some nice decoration or they were there to help regular passengers identify their station. A number of people in the comments section suggested that they were also there for the benefit of illiterate passengers. And that's a thing I've heard suggested a lot, but I'm not sure that it's correct. So let's talk a little bit about literacy. We tend to think of widespread literacy as a recent thing. Which it is, relatively speaking. At the start of the 19th century, estimates put the literacy rate at 60% for men and 40% for women in Britain. Far from universal. But what you have to bear in mind is that as the Industrial Revolution progressed, it would have been harder and harder to function without some level of literacy. The new industries that sprang up required paperwork and the ability to communicate over distance. There were letters to be sent, forms to be filled out, labels to be written, edicts from management to be read. During the 19th century, standards of education in Britain improved drastically. At the start of the century, education varied widely depending on social class, location and gender. If you were an upper-class boy, you could expect to be schooled to a high standard. If you were a working-class girl, good luck with that. But gradually, legislation came in to redress the balance. Schooling was at private schools for the more wealthy, or the responsibility of the parish for everyone else. From 1818, the so-called ragged schools were set up, charitable organisations for the education of the poor. In 1880, attendance at school became compulsory from the ages of 5 to 10, although children of farm workers were granted leave to finish schooling early in order to help out on the farm. Parents were expected to pay for their children's education until the 1891 Free Education Act. In 1893, the school leaving age was raised to 11. The gender gap began to close. By the end of the century, male and female literacy was about the same. By 1900, the literacy rate in the general population had risen to 97%. Literacy tends to be higher in cities than in rural areas, so I think it's safe to assume that by the time the underground lines in question first opened, in 1906 to 1907, just about everyone in London could read. There are some qualifications here. The most obvious one is language. For instance, in 1895, David Lloyd George, future Prime Minister and patriotic Welshman, made a number of speeches decrying the London and North Western Railway. The LNWR provided their company literature in English, which was no good for those of their employees who spoke only Welsh. Many members of the Jewish community in London's East End spoke only Yiddish. There was a Chinese community in Limehouse and a French community in Soho. In other words, while someone might be able to read, they might not be able to read English. Of course, one could counter that such communities would mostly have been fairly insular and therefore perhaps unlikely to use the tube regularly, but it's just a thought. But to be honest, I don't think poor literacy or even a lack of English would be enough of an issue to justify the expense of special tiling designs for every station on the tube. No other railway felt this need to make their stations so deliberately distinctive. The Central London Railway, which prided itself on catering to every member of society, had plain white tiles at every station. We might also point out that, while patterns might make the station recognisable, it isn't much use if you don't know which station it is in the first place. Or if you don't know that every pattern is unique, it's not something mentioned in contemporary underground publicity, and it might not be something you notice particularly if you're not a regular commuter. I should also, as a little side note, point out that the station names weren't the only signage in the stations. There were signs pointing to the way out, giving the direction of travel, and all sorts of other useful information. There's no provision for illiteracy with those. 
One theory I've heard, and it's one I have mentioned in previous videos, is that the patterns were for the benefit of regular commuters. You might not be able to see a station sign from the carriage window, but if you know your station's pattern, you don't have to. But there's a third, less interesting possibility. What if they just did it because it looks nice? While the underground group did have a distinctive visual style that they used on all their deep level tube lines, they still had plenty of variation. If you look at Leslie Green's stations, the oxblood coloured buildings he designed are similar, but every one is different. If that philosophy was applied at platform level, then you might well get something like the similar but different patterns we have now. Ultimately, I guess it's always going to be a bit of a mystery unless someone turns up a definitive policy statement. I'm sure the tiles were useful to people who couldn't read and to people who couldn't see their station sign, even if that wasn't the intent behind creating them. But for now, let's just appreciate them for what they are. Another of those quirky but delightful things that make the tube a little bit special. Hello all, I hope you enjoyed this functionally literate tale from the tube. If you did, then a like would be much appreciated, and you can subscribe for more on the history of the tube and other things that take my interest. Which theory do you favour for the tiles? Let me know in the comments section, and fortunately I am literate enough to be able to read most of them. Thanks as ever to my donors on Ko-fi and Patreon for their generosity. You are the free education act to my bumbling illiteracy. And I'll see you all again very soon for another tale from the tube.